Hello, all of you people. Wouldn't it be great if I tore my face off and was like, I'm Linda, <laughs> I'm Linda Brinkley. It's me. <laughs> they don't understand that, but you understand it. And that's all that matters to me. <clears throat> um, hi, how are you guys doing? You braved the wind tunnel. <laughs> I almost like was able to just fly here. Um, so uh, for those who don't know, just in case I just wandered in randomly, my name is Chuck Wendick and I have written too many books and should probably stop. No. Uh, no, that's good. It's a good answer. Uh, so in 2019, I wrote a, a little tiny book called Wanderers. Uh, and in this book, there was a pandemic that came from bats and happened during a contentious political election year. Uh, and so uh, I've tricked you all into thinking that this is about wayward, but really this is just my apology to So I'm just <laughs> here to say sorry about that. Um, so when I uh, got my, did my deal for Wanderers, um, ironically, what I was most looking forward to was writing a standalone album. Um, and so part of the reason for this is kind of some weird publishing inside the baseball stuff. But like when you, especially in sci-fi and fantasy, when you start off writing in those genres, uh, the publishers are like, hey, we're going to sign you for not one book. We're going to pick you up for three books. And we want those three books to be connected. It's going to be a series. Uh, and it's sort of what you always want. It's not like, yeah, a series. It's kind of a big thing. It's what you read as a kid. And like got these, you know, you know, epic fantasy series or sci-fi series. And so it feels great to get that deal. Uh, the only problem with that is, so when the first book comes out, uh, you get a lot of attention. The publisher gives it a lot of oomph, a lot of marketing dollars, gives it a lot of love. Uh, bookstores are like, ah, oh, book one in the series. And everybody loves that. Um, and so there's a lot of energy. It's cool. And then the second book comes out and the publishers are like, yeah, we kind of did that. Like, we think the first book is just going to magically carry the second book. We don't even need to tell people that that second book exists. It's just going to happen naturally. It will fall from the skies like snow and they will just be mysteriously aware as if they're connected to some sort of secret network uh, of bookstores. They understand it's out. So don't worry about it. So what happens is in that second book, you find like your orders are cut and the attention's a little less and it's not as exciting of a release. And so you're writing at that point, the third book. So you're writing the third book while you're feeling sad about the second book. So by that third book, you're like, it's really hard not to just write like rocks fall, everybody dies. And like, <laughs> just be like, wah, wah, and you shelve that book and, and say game over goodbye. So I was super excited to write a big, chunky, standalone, one and done book. Ironically, I'm here for the sequel to that book. So I really screwed that up. I really screwed that up big time. But I did say at the time Wanderers was coming out, um, I knew that the story was in my mind complete on, on terms of what Wanderers was trying to do and trying to tell this tale. Uh, but I also said like, A, if I have a story idea for a second book and it lines up magically with the other thing that needs to happen, which is enough people have actually picked up the first one. So uh, I'm not writing a sequel into a void. Like I'm, I want to write a sequel from people who are invested in reading. This. Um, so I needed those two things to happen uh, before I was going to commit to even thinking about doing a sequel. Thankfully, they did. Uh, and I was on tour for Wanderers uh, in 2019 in July on the plane. And I like the, the plot for Wayward sort of dawned upon me. I was like, oh, I sort of get it now. Uh, not like every literal moment of it, but I just understood the purpose of it and the scope of it. So I sort of filed that away uh, to keep it in, in my cheek, like a hamster storing, you know, whatever hamster chow. What do hamsters even eat these days? Is it just hamster food? I guess so. Nuts? Do they eat nuts? Seeds? No. It's not the point of the talk, but I'm just, now I'm sort of like curious what hamsters are eating. Um, so that was all fine and good. And we signed the contract to produce Wayward. Uh, and then uh, you're going to excuse my language here, but in March of 2020, an actual fucking pandemic happened. The <laughs> AFP, we'll call it. So <clears throat> suddenly, I was getting a lot of emails. <laughs> I was getting a lot of emails. Uh, people were both dazzled by my prognostication abilities, uh, and people were very also upset with me as if, how, how dare you, what did you do? Um, so this is, of course, the time where I am supposed to put out the asterisk and the caveat that I say, I did not cause the pandemic. Um, I did not even really predict it in the grand scheme of things because, you know, like sci-fi writers and horror writers, I don't think we're out there um, trying to predict the future. I like to think we're trying to talk about the present, and that's really what Wanders was about to me. It was sort of a 
a catalyzation and a contextualization of a lot of the anxieties I was feeling at the time about a whole lot of things. And Wanders was, I call it my anxiety Voltron, where all of those anxieties came together and formed this big epic story. Um, so, you know, it was easy to see that pandemics happen from time to time. It was easy to see that they make zoonotic jumps from bats. Uh, it was easy to see that there was a contentious political environment brewing. Uh, it was easy to see all of these things. Um, except there was one thing that I sort of maybe think, like, uh-oh. Like, that was like a something slipped through the cracks between worlds and left my book into the real world, and I was not entirely happy to hear that. So in Wanderers, there is a, a predictive intelligence called Black Swan, and Black Swan predicts the coming pandemic, okay? That's the whole thing. Is like it sees this pandemic coming, and it starts to mobilize the sleepwalkers. Uh, in real life, the COVID-19 pandemic was forewarned by about a week by an algorithm called Blue Dot. And I was like, oh, no, I did, it's like it's two colors, black and blue, two BL-fronted colors, black, blue. And then like to wear the black dot, I was like, oh, no, that's too, that was too close uh, for me. And I was very, very upset about that. So it is, it may be possible it's my fault. So <laughs> I said it's not my fault, but like I kind of, like there's like a 5% chance it was my fault. So again, for me, I know, I know, I didn't, I didn't mean it, if that helps any. It was just a, yeah, Siri, yeah, yeah. So suddenly I had a book to write in the middle of an AFP. And during this time, uh, you know, I had my ideas and here was this like, you know, before the pandemic happened, I wrote a book about a pandemic. And then during a pandemic, I was I'm going not to write. Sure I understand. Oh, oh my gosh! <laughs> Black <laughs> Swan. <laughs> yeah, nobody understands Siri. Nobody understands. Um, then during a pandemic, I was here going to write a book that's set after a pandemic. So it was quite odd. Uh, and I set out to write this book, and I went to write one day. And uh, you know, I feel like I came up in the freelance trenches, so I would write uh, reliably and diligently through most turmoil in my life. Um, whatever was befalling me that day, I figured I could always get out 500 words and, and manage it reliably. Uh, but I went to write Wayward and then it was just like, like the wind howling outside right now, that was Wayward for me. It was just kind of nothing. And so I thought, well, that's okay. Because like, you know what, we're all living in this weird ambient miasma, this area of effect trauma. So I just, I'm, it's fine tomorrow. So the next day came and I went to write and eh, still maybe not Maybe not that day either. So at the time I was editing two of my books. I was editing Dust of Grimm, a middle grade that I had come out in paperback last month, and The Book of Accidents. And my brain worked really well with editing because it felt like something I was fixing. And so I could just sort of deep dive under the tinkering and fixing and sort of just moving lines around and making that work. And that felt good, like it was working. Uh, but so like Wayward, I came back to it the week after, the week after that, and then the month after that, a few months went by. And it was still not happening. And so finally, it was about in October that I was able to sit down and produce some words. And they were slow words. They were about, I did maybe like 300 words that first day. And this is, I'm usually used to writing about 1,500, 2,000 words a day. So like 300 felt like not a lot, but it felt like a whole lot after months of just absolutely nothing. So at that point, I realized that I had essentially, creatively speaking, broken my leg. And that it was now the time where I have healed the leg, I have needed to give it some time. Uh, and I am, I started to kind of limp forward slowly, but surely, uh, and I couldn't break into a run. Certainly wasn't going to do any narrative marathons at that point, but it allowed me to progress forward, uh, and eke my way through the story. What was additionally strange about writing wayward during this time was, and it's something that has not happened to me since and never happened to me before is I don't exactly remember writing it. <laughs> Sounds Kind of strange. Um, already, Wanderers broke me in a different way. Wanderers was the book that I always joke. Um, I, it's not even really a joke. It taught me that I don't know how to write books, uh, which sounds bad because it turns out I've written a lot of them. So, it, you know, I feel like I should know by now how to write a book. Uh, but it was really good news that I don't know how to write a book because what happens, I think, with writers um, and as a person myself who gives writing advice sometimes uh, in books and on the blog. Um, I think we often repeat advice. Oh, you got to you know, sit down every day, write every day, 2,000 words a day, whatever it is we sort of repeat. Uh, we also begin to kind of mythologize or folklorize our own 
processes. Like we think this is how we write, and so this is how we must always do it. And Wanderers was not like that. I, you know, with Wanderers, I, I didn't outline. I always outline my book. And Wanderers, this massive, sprawling, fairly plotty, crunchy book. I didn't outline a word of it. Uh, and some days were, you know, 500 word days. Some days were 5,000 word days. And some days were just deep research dives. It was just sort of an inconsistent, erratic book. Uh, Wayward continued that trend and maybe turned up the volume a little bit in that every day, you know, usually I would write a book when I'm writing a book. I sit down, I, I do my word count, I get to the point in the story, I feel like I'm stopping. And I usually end kind of in the middle of something happening. I always like to kind of fall off my own little cliffhanger because it helps me kind of stay in that moment. And so when I leave the office, um, to the chagrin of my family, I'm kind of still mentally in that world. So, you know, sometimes they're waving their hands in front of my face. Like, are you in book world again? I'm like, yeah, I'm in book world. I'm sorry. It's like, again, the kitchen's on fire behind me. And it's like, it's fine. I was just thinking story stuff. Don't worry. We'll just put that pesky little fire out. And uh, Wayward Eight wasn't like that. I didn't carry it with me. I didn't come inside the house and have this, like, oh, I'm going to keep tinkering and keep thinking about it. Uh, it was sort of just like a etch a sketch. You just shake it and then it was blank. And so I would go in the next day and be like, I'm not really sure what I did yesterday. So I would have to go back and reread the chapter to be like, oh, okay, I need to refamiliarize myself with what occurred on the page that day. And so that was every day. And then by the time I finished the book and it was time to like turn it into my editor, I was like, oh no, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I did. It could be all work and no play makes Chuck a dull boy for 280,000 words because that is how long this book that I didn't know I was writing, it, it, uh, you know, I fugued out during the entire experience. I, I mean, I did look at it to make sure that there were words in order and the sentences appeared to happen and that seemed like a good sign. So I, I sent it off to her and to my absolute shock and awe, um, my editorial letter was fairly trim. <laughs> it was not, it was, uh, yeah, I think Wanderers, I had, I had a 17 page edit letter and it was just a lot of like little crunchy things. It wasn't like this massive rewrite, but it was just, uh, this sort of thoughtful deep dive. My editor, Trisha Narwani, is, is honestly the greatest editor I've ever had. I'm very lucky. Uh, but her comments on Wayward were fairly nice, like it kind of worked, uh, which shocked me entirely that this book I fugued out entirely during writing, um, that it worked at all. So, but the interesting postscript to all of this is it actually led me to a other new book. So in June of 2023, I have a new writing advice book coming out uh, called Gentle Writing Advice. Uh, which is very much about writing in this sort of strange time of chaos and, and weirdness that's going on around us. Not just the pandemic, but just sort of everything feels very, there's a lot of tumult and turbulence going on, culturally speaking. And so I think it's sometimes hard to get yourself together, uh, especially when, you know, when I started out writing uh, in my freelance days, well over 10 years ago, 20 years ago at this point, a lot of the advice was kind of what I might argue sort of an MFA style like I listen to the clouds, like that's my writing advice. Like I just, the inspiration takes me. And then I, you know, I write one book every 10 years. Then I go teach my English class at college and, you know, I have tenure and it's great. It just sort of felt like that kind of advice. Whereas the working writer was not necessarily being spoken to. So, you know, I think as online became more of a thing and social media became more of a thing, I think more and more writers came out and, and started to write that just like I was doing that rubber meets the road kind of writing advice, right? Like, Hey, you know, sometimes writing is just ditch digging. Sometimes writing is just moving earth. Sometimes it's, you got to sit down, button chair, type your words. And it's all true. None of that's really false. Writing is work and it should be treated and respected as, as, as work, not just sort of a dilettante's dream. It's sometimes a big effort, but also there's another side of it. It is kind of a strange artsy, I talk to the clouds kind of a thing. It's kind of both of those things. And, you know, when we mythologize our processes and when like I'm writing wayward or wanderers and that process fails entirely, how do you survive that moment? How does that not break you in turn? And so when a pandemic hits or when turmoil hits your own life, or when there's just a general bump in the road, how do you deal with that? How does that, how do you course correct it? How do you overcome that? Sometimes the, the sort of other side of the advice because now the, you know, button chair, or you got to work, work, work advice is now the dominant mode of writing advice. And so with gentle writing advice, the goal was sort of be, to be contrary to that, to, to even be contrary to myself and any advice I've given in the past to sort of revise and relook at and, and uh, you know, dice up those old chestnuts and to see if there was a softer, kinder way to talk about some of this stuff. Uh, and that is what uh, resulted sort of weirdly from the chaotic process 
of writing the sequel to the pandemic book. Again, I'm sorry about the pandemic. <laughs> so um, with that being said, uh, I will gladly take questions from any of you if you have them. questions, prayer requests, death threats, marriages, proposals, whatever you have, uh, I will gladly field them accordingly. Yes. Hey, um, Hi. So excited. Uh, we just heard about this on the radio two days ago, hmm? completely random. That oh, is this the Charlotte uh, thing I did? No, no, no. The WCQS, our public radio station, announced that you were coming. Oh, and cool. So we got excited and here we are. Oh, hello. So, uh, well, thank you. We read your book of accidents. Yes. Yeah. The first novel, which was supremely weird. Oh, it's pretty weird. Yeah. Thank you, though. I'm and... glad you like that. But I assume you like you didn't say you liked it. I shouldn't have said. It. Yes. Like, no, really liked it. Thanks. Really liked Mary Black. But I'm also a um, pretty big Star Wars fan. Oh, so sure. I'm super yes. excited that you wrote the Star Wars books. Oh, good. Thank you. So how did that come out? How did you get to write a oh book like of a, novels about Star Wars? Uh, it's obviously, and it's why I always tell people you can't you can't ever do what another writer does uh, to mimic their success. I tweeted about it which is not normally how you would get work. Um, but I did, when I knew Disney had procured the license and I knew new movies were going to be coming out, I was like, well, they must be doing new books. So I just tweeted, I'm like, man, I'd really love to write some of those. That'd be really cool. And then I had enough sort of followers in this, the orbit of actual Star Wars. Um, Gary Weta, who wrote the story for Rogue One, uh, one of the husbands to uh, the editor at Del Rey at the time. Um, a few other people actually sort of kicked the ball where it needed to go. And then next thing I know, I had the editor at Delray being like, can, I, can we meet um, at Comic-Con? Can we talk? And so I said, sure. So I met her and she's like, so I read your books. And I said, well, then it was nice meeting you. Thanks for giving me the chance. <laughs> and she's like, no, I read a different one. <laughs> I was like, good. I thought maybe you read the Mirror Black books. I'm like, those are not very star worthy. So, um, she read the uh, my Heartland series, the young adult series, which I kind of wrote as like a John Steinbeckian Star Wars. Like I wanted it to be Star Warsy, but with a sort of a dust bowl aesthetic. And so um, she liked them, and she said, "Like you know, we we need you to turn around an outline to us." And I turned that around pretty quickly. And they had no at that time really no like intensely rigorous thing they wanted because there were movies coming out in a year. And they had no books. So they were like, we don't really know what we want. We know it just can't feature the main characters. I was like, well, that's even better because then there's no pressure. I don't have to follow some rigorous path. I'm allowed to make up my own kind of thing here. And, you know, you've just given me the fence and I just have to stay in the fence. I can do that. So I pitched and they liked it. And then I set to work. The weird part was, <laughs> so I tweeted on it about it on September 4th um, that year. And then they told me just as I was about to start writing the book, hey, good news, the book that was coming out when you're writing, it was coming out in November, is now coming out in September. I was like, oh, that's cool, it's coming out earlier. Yeah, like, we're gonna do this big Force Friday thing. It's gonna be wild. And actually, it turns out I launched it um, in Atlanta at DragonCon. Anyway, so she said the only, just as a side note, the only downside to that is you had three months to write the book, but the deadline now is also moving two months, so you have one month to write the book. <laughs> so I was like, Cool. Uh, I'm sure, I could. I could do that. And so, at that time, I had I had construction had begun on my own personal Death Star, uh, my writing shed, and it was completed just before I started writing it. And so, I went out into the shed and, and nailed out about I think it was 80, 90 thousand words, whatever it was, uh, in a month. And uh, it held together pretty well. Now, I mean, it wasn't the only draft we did. I mean, there was time to edit, but. Uh, it was a very, very tight turnaround time because that book then came out on September 4th, literally one year after the tweet. Uh, and that was how I got into writing Star Wars. Awesome. Yeah, it's weird. So, yeah. Sir? You said you can't, you can't use the, the characters from Star Wars. Um, any of them? Well, the, just they didn't want the, your, your, the sort of gospel characters, Luke, Leia, on. Um, okay. Now, as I wrote Aftermath, they were like, okay, we're going to put in, we want Han in there for a chapter. I was like, okay, I can do Han in there for a chapter. And then for the second book, they, I used Han and Leia were completely, I never got to touch Luke. I actually, in the third book, I had chapters with Luke in there. 
And they were like, we have to pull that because he was active as it turns out in the sequel trilogy. And we don't want to mess up anything. Like we don't want to pluck this string and find out it changed something and the script no longer makes sense. So, oh, yeah. so I did, I mean, but I mean, I got to play with all the other characters. Anything else I wanted to reference was pretty good to do. Um, you know, it was like a weird, it was weird. Cause like you would get these, especially on the first book, I would get these like secretive calls and they'd be like, okay, we need you to know that there's this planet called Jakku, but like, I couldn't type it out. I had to like write it down in case like hackers were going to, but then like, it was inevitable that like, whenever they told me something like a week later, they announced it to the media anyway. So I was like, it wouldn't have changed anything. It's fine. Like it would have been totally fine. Um, and there were a couple instances of like, oh, this character you're using, they're going to show up in a video game in like 10 years. So I was like, can we not worry about that though? Because like video games are notoriously unreliable. So I know this is vaporware. Can I just still use the character? They were pretty good with that. So uh, it was a weird experience. Yeah. Wow. It's so, it's so amazing that, that, you, that someone says, hey, can you do something in this, in this case, in this universe? And you have to go to that universe. Yeah. Yeah. I got to play in that, that sandbox. Yeah, cool. It's crazy. Yeah. Question yeah. from. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, Jennifer asks, going into writing Wayward now, or you know, when you were writing it, knowing there was an actual pandemic going on, how did you deal with the potential influence of real life events? Uh yes. Yeah, so she asks about the influence of real life, the AFP, the actual pandemic, um, on writing Wayward. Uh, I mean, I could, it, it, I couldn't not let it influence it. Like I, it's hard not to be like, I was pickled in it. Like we're all marinating in an actual pandemic. So, uh, I thought well, I'm going to just use that. I mean, I didn't want to use it directly. I didn't want to like have the explicit things, um, you know, from what we were seeing around us, especially since we were to set after a pandemic has already sort of decimated everything. Um, but I thought, yeah, I mean, there's going to be things in there. I think that are uh recognizable to people um uh alex brown did a great uh review today uh at tour.com uh for wayward and they really kind of nail that like you know to some degree wayward is still reckoning with what it was written in like in the midst of the pandemic it's still reckoning with some of that even though it's over in that book um wayward the pandemic's gone um and it's now about what happens in the after time um, but you know, it still is grappling with some of those things and what it sees and what it deals with, but the emotional fallout, the physical fallout of it is, is present in that world. So, um, with these books and also with the Miriam Black books, you, you know, you wrote the first trilogy of the Black books and, and you wrote Wanderers and you went away from those worlds and then later on you came back to them after having done other stuff in yeah. between is it kind of challenging to get back into the heads of these characters and back into the world after you've been working on other stuff no i you know, it wasn't really um maybe it should have been miriam you know i wrote the first three books fairly back to back so they were like pretty you know changed together and then it was only the second three books that had some distance between the first trilogy and the second trilogy because there's a change of publisher and trying to figure out what those books were. Um, but Miriam is alive in my brain in ways I can't, I mean, she's very uh, clear to me in terms of what she would do and say. And, um, and having that much practice at writing her, three books of writing her sort of made it so I, I didn't have to do much work to get back to Miriam. Um, and though characters from Wanderers, you know, they in the same way lived with me pretty well. Like I. I think part of the thing with Wanderers is because it's such a big book and we spend a lot of time with these characters that they, for lack of a better term, imprinted upon me. Like I am, so, you know, it comes times like I generally speaking will know what they're going to do. Outside of Pete Corley, though, I never know what he's going to do, uh, which is the fun of writing Pete Corley, probably. Sorry. Do you keep notes or, or books on, on, on each of the characters, you know, on the characters as something to reference when you go back to that? No, the, the wow. book is its own. Kind. I mean, I'll have some very spare notes, just a line here and a line there. Um, but yeah, no, I don't keep like story Bibles or character Bibles or anything. Like that. The book is its own. You know, I could always just look back at Wayward or Wanderers to figure out what was up there. 
You're in black inspired by someone you know personally or somebody you know from history or no, she's just you know kind of a, a, a pastiche of like just a lot of people I've grown up with and you know, I know there was always a feeling of I've seen some reviews of Miriam's the book the Miriam books that which I, I you know I feel are for lack of a better term misogynist that they're like, well, women don't talk like that, they don't act like that. They're it's and they're like, oh, it's clear a man or women don't use foul language and stuff like that. <laughs> so I tell this story about my wife, where you know, we would go down to the shore and do the classic hunting of shells thing at the shore. You know, our kid would run around and find shells and we would save them as a memento going forward to so keep them in a jar, bring them home. So uh, after one of these trips, uh, we brought home one shell jar. Uh, and then I guess one of the shells in there maybe had an inhabitant recently pass. So it was not a clean, dry shell, but rather a somewhat moist one. And so when she opened the jar, a seafoody smell will go with came out. And my wife's comment was, it smells like Aquaman's taint in here. <laughs> and I was like, yep, women talk like that. That's, that's not me. That's, that's what's happening. So, yeah. Anybody else? Did you randomly uh, the Miriam book that you mentioned earlier, was that Oh, you read. Waters? Yeah. Did, did you know about that ahead of time, or did you find something... Yeah, I tried to re as I was writing the book, I knew even really before I started writing it, I was like, I knew it needed to land in a specific kind of place. It was a place that was isolated enough from the world, but also just connected enough that it could sustain. Um, and there were a few really sort of fringe places. There's like some town in a canyon in the Southwest. And there's, this. so I was like, there's just some places that are too extreme that I don't quite believe. Like, they would have provided interesting storytelling. Like, you have to go into this almost pit to, like, live in a town. Like, but there was no way to sustain in those places. So, it's like, Ure has, you know, hydraulic power, and it has in the surrounding environments, which you get out of the valley, and, you know, you have more verdant landscape, um, livestock outside of it. So, if you need to raise it, you can sort of have, like, a, an orbiting, you know, sustainable area that feeds this town. Uh, so, I went out. I visited, I, I was doing um, StokerCon uh, in Long Beach with, um, oddly, George R. R. Martin. They were like, guest of honor, George R. R. Martin and Chuck Wending. I was like, I don't, <laughs> one of these things is not like the other. Uh, are you sure? Like, I felt like, is that a typo? That can't be a typo. But he was very nice, and we uh, actually did some gaming together out there for as one of the events. It was very cool. So I then drove part of the way, and I'd already done some stuff with Pacific Northwest, but I had drove um, from California to looping around through Utah and Nevada into um, Colorado, and then to Ure and to sort of stop. And then I stayed there for a few days and did some research. Um, and so apparently the town is quite happy about this. They have like the bookstore there, which is a bookstore that's in the book. Um, they are very happy and they have a display up and they want me to come out and do an event out there. The word parade was used, so I'm not I'm terrified. I'm a little terrified <laughs> that that's a thing that might happen. But uh, yeah. So. As quick aside, um, positively comparing you with George R. R. Martin, you get to be the one who's younger and thinner and actually finishes the stuff you start doing. So uh, well, for now, don't don't don't, don't count me out. It's like yeah, I might I might start to. Yeah. yeah, I might I might fritter out. It's all right. We don't know. I'm definitely been putting on pandemic weight, so I'm trying to trying to get into that George R. R. Martin mindset, body set, sir. I thought much of the power of Wander was how you made it, even though science fiction, you made it so plausible. In the process of developing a 900 page story, do you have to make U turns when you say? Yeah, this this isn't really plausible. I need to refine that or do more research. Or you kind of straight course. I was pretty much on a straight course, especially with Wanderers, because um, I had already researched a lot of that stuff. Like I said, it was based sort of on the anxieties I was already feeling, and so being anxious, I read about those things to make I try to understand those things. So I had been for years researching things like climate change or pandemics or um, 
you know, changing political landscape or post antibiotic age. Like there's all these things that I was like just interested in um, from a terror perspective, but also like a fascinating, like this is something that we're all dealing with. So I want to sort of research it. Um, so when it came time to actually write the book, I kind of had that stuff in mind. And so when it goes to the science fiction side of things, I, I like the writing advice I always give, or at least what I, you worked for me was like, I call it the two truths and a lie situation. Like if I'm going to make up a science fiction conceit, something harebrained and wild and weird, nanobots and your, you know, whatever, uh, I want there to be pieces of truth leading up to it. So it feels like I'm not inventing this entire thing, but like, I'm only inventing the top. Like there's, I'm going to get us there with some fiction or some fact. And then I'm going to, that Sunday is going to be topped with cherry of fiction. Like I want it to be, you know, feel organic to the piece, even though, you know, it's science fiction. Obviously I'm not writing fact. I'm not writing a nonfiction. Thank God it's not nonfiction. I mean, it's for as much as the stuff that I got right. I mean, it's obviously still definitely strays into that, as you know, kind of a science fiction horror realm. Um, so I, I try to get those things right by building in as much sort of true stuff as I could. Yes. So Bonnie at home says, are you done with the sleepwalkers world now? Or could there be an unintended trilogy? Oh, uh, Bonnie asks, uh, could there be an unintended trilogy? I don't know. Like it's just sort of the same thing with one, uh, Wayward. I don't have an intention to write a third book. Um, at this point, there's no plans to write a third book. There's no deal to write a third book. Um, if Wayward hits really well and people are really interested in it and I, I, you know, like with Wayward, I have kind of a loose thing I would want to do with the third book. Um, I would probably move it a little even more forward in time, not just five years this time, but maybe 10, 20 years. Um, and it would be at least half new characters and some different unfolding situations. Still have ties to the previous two books, but something that might stand alone a little bit more. Um, but that's like a, that could change. Like it's a, it's a pipe dream at this point. So I don't, uh, I, I make no promises, but we shall see. Yeah. So um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between writing for adults and oh. young readers. Yeah, the difference between writing for adults and young readers. I um, like on the surface, it's not really that different, right? Because stories are stories, and you know, I would say like you know, we I don't look like a dolphin, but we actually have some of the same bones. So as much as we're different animals, there's still some really key bones you got to get right. So at a, at a sort of a narrative construction level, it's sort of the same thing. I'm trying to hit these. To the beats and I still write them the same way. I still write front to back, start to finish, uh, because I'm just not smart enough to keep all of these disparate chapters uh, in my mind. Um, but obviously, you know, you just sort of are considering a different audience. Like I, you know, I'm not going to write, you know, some hardcore horror scenes into uh, the, the middle grade. Uh, although it does have some creepy stuff, and I've even had some adults read it and be like, "Well, that's actually pretty scary." Like, right? Nice. Uh, <laughs> if I scare the adults and the kids together, I feel like I brought a family together. Um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, just sort of considering your audience, certainly there's a, you know, when I read middle grade, there's a middle grade perspective involved. Like you're trying to sort of get, get to that level, like, you know, where my son is at, at, at his age, I'm trying to get down to that level and tell those stories that are interesting to them. And some of the things that are bothering them or they're dealing with, or they should be able to recognize that stuff in that book. Um, and the adult stuff just, you know, just gets into worse, weirder, <laughs> uh, scarier, stuff. Does your, does your, I, I'm just throwing this in, does your son like to read scary stuff? Yeah, it's funny. I don't, I don't know if it was my doing or not, but like he was up, he's in sixth grade now. And up until this point, he was a good reader in the sense that he would read thoroughly, understand it well. But like, you had to be like, hey, it's reading time. He's like, uh, okay, I'll read. So I read for my 30 minutes. And then like, he could be in the middle of the chapter, close the book and done. I was like, oh, you're not me. Okay. <laughs> you're not, you're not me. So, you know, it's like summer reading was like, you have to read three books. He'd be like, one, two, three, and I'm out. Like, okay. All right. Like, hurts my heart. I'm not going to say anything because you should be your own person. Oh. <laughs> but then this past summer, so he read Dustin Grimm and really actually surprisingly liked it because up until this point, he has been remarkably underwhelmed. Like he's a fan of Star Wars, but you know, I read Star Wars. He's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Like that's, that's cool, old man. But then he'd be like, oh, is your friend Delilah Dawson writing new Star Wars? Cause can I have that? I'm like, yeah, you, 
want. You're going to have that. He's like, what are you going to write Minecraft books? I'm like, sure. I, okay. I, I see what you're saying. Um, but he read Dustin Grimm and actually responded really well to it. He's like, I really like this book. I was like, oh, okay. All right. That's good. And then this past summer, you know, for summer reading, I think it was like, you know, three books or whatever. And he read 22 and a uh, majority horror. <laughs> like, it was like, he was a kid who was always like, I don't want to watch horror, scary stuff. Me. I don't want to do it. And then he read some, uh, some really scary stuff. Uh, you know, Delilah Dawson's uh, Camp Scare. Uh, Laura Sense the Clackety has a serial killer in it. Like, I mean, it's like for a middle grade, it's pretty, it's pretty dark stuff. Um, uh, Ali Malinenko's uh, Ghost Girl in the Spirit House. Actually, read Ghost Girl probably before the summer. Uh, so he really fell pretty, pretty deep into the horror pit. Uh, and now he, he finally was like, can we watch Stranger Things? It was like, oh, uh, okay. It is time. So we watch, we just literally mainlined four seasons of Stranger Things. Uh, every night, we'd be like, you want to watch Star Wars? And he's like, nope, I want to watch Stranger Things. We're like, Scary times at Shelby. You know. This is, I guess, kind of building on what you were just talking about about your son. Did you, like, get feedback from him as you were writing the younger books to kind of see if you were getting the tone right, if you were getting the whole vibe right? No, I didn't, actually. Um, I didn't have him read it in process first because I don't generally let him. He, I mean, he's my kid, and he's very special, and I love him, too. But no one reads my stuff as I'm going because it just doesn't. I may decide to reverse course on something, or it may just be, like, I don't need that kind of it's a river and I'm not going to dam it up. Even if it's not a, even if the river is going the wrong direction, I need to do that. And then when it's done, you know, we can get there. Um, but he didn't actually read it until it was in print. Um, and so, uh, but I mean, I, I mean, I listened to him and I would ask him questions and try to vibe what was happening with him in school and um, just sort of extrapolate and find that sort of level of empathy with what he's going through and so forth. So what kind of stuff do you like to read? Uh, I mean, it's, it's hard. I really do like to read horror, um, especially right now. Like, my gosh, horror is having a moment. Um, <laughs> like, their horror shelf in here has got some really great uh, books on it that I would totally recommend you read. Um, you know, I just I met, actually, last night. There's a novel over there called The Hollow Kind by Andy Davidson, um, a phenomenal book. Uh, and I just met him last night at uh, Eagle Eye Books. And he was sneaky too. He did the, the bookstore equivalent of uh, paying for the dinner check without you noticing. I was like, because he came up and signed a book. I'm like, he's like, oh, it's I'm Andy. I'm like, oh my God, you're okay. That's great. And I was like, it's your book here because I would like you to sign it and then I'm going to buy it. And he's like, yes, they brought it over and signed it. And then I went to pay for it after the event and they were like, he already paid for it. I was like, oh, <laughs> oh, mic drop moment from him. So um, he's great. Uh, Delilah Dawson's The Violence is now on paperback. That's a fantastic novel about a, also a pandemic that creates sort of sporadic bits of intense violence. Um, and it's sort of set during this, uh, a family that's sort of imploding due to domestic violence issues and um, they bring in this pandemic of violence and then there's pro wrestling. Commentary. It's great. It's a really cool, uh, wonderful book. Um, Paul Tremblay is always a go-to author for me. Uh, Stephen Graham Jones, another go-to author for me. Stephen Graham Jones is twisted twisted man uh, i love him dearly for what he does um uh, i haven't read it yet but eric Worth's white horse I'm, I'm dying to get into uh that's supposed to be great so um yeah it's good stuff a question from the interwebs yes from the interwebs um can we expect more horror along with the accidents um <laughs> Yes. Specifically, perhaps with a leap forward inspired evil <laughs> For, So that's a two things about that. Uh, the question is, am I going to write more horror a la Book of Accidents? Uh, first of all, the answer to that is definitely a yes. Um, because I have a, an evil apple book coming out. Um, a book about evil apples, which sounds silly, but it's very not silly. Uh, there's a cult business going on and a, a sinister orchard and colonialism. It's a lot of, it's a very weird American Horror story. So uh, that theoretically comes out in fall of 2023. We are still settling on a title. I think the publisher likes calling it The Orchard, um, which I like, but also I feel like there's a lot of other books called The Orchard. So we're, not, we're trying to massage that. Maybe The Orchard's Tale, because there's sort of a tale telling component to it. Um, so, but then the side part of the question is will there perhaps be an evil leaf blower? Because I hate leaf blowers super a lot. Uh, <laughs> I live. 
in, you know, outside of a neighborhood, but next to a neighborhood. And there are leaf blowers happening always. So, and there's a new neighbor and this new neighbor will be out at eight, nine o'clock, leaf blowing leaf blowing and leaf blowing just juggling one leaf around <laughs> and it's not even just like one droning sounds like yeah uh, uh, i hate it blood it's coming out of my ears um curiously i apparently have hated them uh, for a long time because in much of the ways that i said i don't remember what i wrote in wayward i guess in some of the opening pages of wayward uh one of the main characters is being like hey this new world is quiet and there's no leaf blowers so i apparently have already uh, inserted my leaf blower angst into one of my books. <laughs> so I'm nothing if not predictable, I guess. So, anybody else? Any more interweb questions you people out there, you can ask. Don't see any right, right now. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and interject an answer to a question for you. Oh, okay. Hamsters eat. Yes. Commercial hamster pellets. Okay. Small amounts of fresh fruits, vegetables, or herbs. Uh huh. Timothy Hay, whatever that is, mm. and occasional treats like nuts. Okay, like nuts. Boiled eggs or mealworms. Sure, mealworms. Okay. okay. I don't know what Timothy Hay is, but I'm going to pretend it's a person. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you, know, you can't actually believe everything you hear on the internet, but there you go. That's true. You can't, but you can believe, you can believe Timothy Hay is a guy who's being eaten by hamsters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the name of my next book. Yes, it sounds like a middle grade. <laughs> Timothy Hay is being eaten by hamsters. Uh, that's like Dr. Seuss. It is like a Dr. Seuss book. Yeah, big picture book. Little poor <laughs> Timothy Hay devoured to death by hamsters. Uh, so that's why you had to ask that question. That's why I had to ask that question. We had to get there. And now um, I owe you a cut, a percentage, whoever the that ten percent of my fee. Um, yeah. Does anybody else want to ask anything about writing apples, books, whatever? Otherwise, we can uh, shut her down. No. Oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, there we are. What are you going to do with your predictive powers next? Uh, I don't know. Just ruin things, apparently. Just, <laughs> like how you, people were like, you really should have written Wayward like, with like pup, and there are puppies, like puppies raining from the heavens. Uh, there is a very good golden retriever in the book, though. So I, I tried to put in, that was my, like, people were like, you need to put puppies in this book. And I was like, I got you covered. And then, I mean, the rest of it's not puppies. It's a nightmare. But there's a very good golden retriever uh, in the book, and a possum. And a fox, two wolves. A lot of animals in this book. A lot of animals. Very animal book. And I figure for the end of the world is you know things start to take back over, putting some animals hamsters. in there. No hamsters yet. That's for apparently my next children's book. <laughs> so, that'll be for the trilogy. That'll be for the trilogy. Yeah, Hamster Town. You know, question. It's another actually book recommendation question. Yeah. Which is I like those. Yeah, specifically. So, and I don't know. You did actually mention a bunch of people, which I was trying to keep up with you. Sure. And then, um, what? What about what should be on our holiday lists? So, do you have any suggestions oh. specifically for gift giving? Well, I mean, for like, um, just any kind, any book, any book for holiday. I, I mean, they weren't specific, so like. Yeah. Oh, like, that's. What's, what should be on our holiday list? Ooh, for, God, that's that's a curious one. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Uh, there is a book out if you like nonfiction, and I do like nonfiction. Um, and part of the reason I'll say first why I like nonfiction a lot as a writer is when I read someone's fiction, I find that it's giving me their idea, which is good. That's how it's supposed to be. But when I read nonfiction, I feel like it's helping me come up with my own ideas because it's just presenting me with sort of information, and then that kind of gets everything juggling upstairs. So uh, Ed Young's um, An Immense World, which they do carry here, I saw it here. Um, is just a great book about animal senses and how animals perceive the world. Uh, Ed was fantastically, actually, a really uh, wonderful voice during the pandemic itself, writing for The Atlantic, he won a Pulitzer for his pandemic coverage. Uh, and I always feel like he brought a really sane, realistic, even keel voice. And his science writing is just super, super accessible. Uh, but an, an immense world is more fun than anything pandemic related. Uh, and it's really insightful and interesting and makes you sort of care extra hard about the world in which we uh, live and exist. So that I think is going to be a great sort of gift because it's also a really cool looking beautiful book. Um, yeah, that's probably my recommendation there. I know there's a new edition. I don't know if it's coming out before the holidays, a new edition of Paul Tremblay's The Cabin at the End of the World. If you want something uh, to really upset people at Christmas, <laughs> that will do it. Uh, he has a, a M. Night Shyamalan adaptation of that novel coming out soon that's pretty cool 
uh, yeah, I would say those are good ones to go with. Oh, I also just bought it. So I don't know when anyone ever wants this. I bought a, a massive encyclopedia of Apple varieties. And it's like a $300 set, but I got it for 150 Feeling good about that. Um, it's literally like a giant, these giant books of Apple varieties. Because there's like, like dark green leather or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm excited. Very excited. I'm just going to live in Apple Town. <laughs> Population me. <laughs> I've got one more question yeah. about um, truth and fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I have, um, when I'm reading a book and the author is describing an activity or this person does art or they have some kind of thing Yeah. and then it's wrong. Oh yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. When, when you're researching uh, some kind of special thing that your character is interested in or involved in, how do you, figure out how to write that in a realistic way. Well, like I said, part of it is just putting in real stuff. And so that pads the lie. Um, you know, you're always going to try to get the right things right and make the wrong things believable. It's not always going to work. And you're certainly not going to always get the right things right because that's hard. <laughs> it's especially writing fiction. It's really hard. The goal is to just not get it so intensely wrong that a large section of your readership will be see that they're like well you know monkeys are not fish like I, why did you put that in there That's, we all know that they're not fish so i was like you know answers eat timothy hey <laughs> duh like okay uh so you want to just sort of get those details as right as you can uh but also like i don't know it's tough like there's you upset gun people you get gun details wrong <laughs> Those are the most emails I get. Uh, there was one point in an early book of mine, probably one of the Miriam Black books, I falsely noted, and I even know this, because like I, for better or for worse, as liberal as I am, I grew up in a gun house. My dad was a gunsmith. He had a gun shop in our driveway. Uh, every Christmas, I would get a new gun. So it was like, there. It was I lived in gun town. So I know guns actually fairly well, for better or for worse but I put a safety on a clock and they don't have a proper clicking safety mechanism. They have a mechanism, but not the type that you thumb. So just that, the emails alone from just that, <laughs> I love your book, but uh, sir, I just want you to know, blocks are like, I could have been like, you know, I could have invented wild facts about things that never existed. And I still get, it would be the Glock people would be very mad at me about that. So, um, and even now, every time I'll see an, uh, author get that one wrong because it feels like obvious like well it's pistol and your safety you're like well but not that one don't do it don't do it for, don't fall for that trap uh and some people are like oh clip first magazine you call it a clip in second magazine you call it a magazine it's actually good they get real salty about it. Uh, you're just like i'm not insulting it i'm not trying to be mean to the gun i don't the gun will be all right he's not upset with me. like it's not like the clock is like whoa so mad um so that's like you know the thing you try to not get wrong because those, do you ever those have, like people that do research or um no i don't generally i mean i'll you know we have copy editors so if they catch something they catch something um star wars facts too I get those wrong you get like a ship wrong oh, boy. Boy. someone will show up and be like i just want to tell you what you've got wrong about that shit <laughs> like and that's the funny thing too like the star wars people were very mad about that you're like you know, Star Wars is just made up. Like, I don't mean like, <laughs> I don't mean that in the obvious way. Like, well, obviously we know it's not real, but I mean, it's like, Star Wars is janky. Like, Star Wars is a jankily told story on purpose. I would say the Millennium Falcon is the most elegant metaphor for Star Wars because it is a piece of junk that they have clamped, they smashed together and you love it and it flies like a god. But it's ugly. It's ugly and strange and mashed up and that's Star Wars. Star Wars is just like, what if we just put all these pieces together? What if we make these weird two genres kiss and then we shove it out into space? They're like, great. And it's fun and we all love it. And that's why we love it. So like people who are really rigorous about like, well, the facts, like the facts, it's Star Wars. What are you talking about facts? <laughs> it's, fact. it's like, okay. So but that one pops a vein in my head sometimes. Anything else? Looks like it's like signing time. Signing time. Let's yeah. do it. All right. So, um, do you want to say good night to the folks at Good night, home? folks at home. Thank you for coming.
so to speak. Thank you for being in your house and looking at me. I don't know why you would do that. Thank you. Good night, folks. Good night. Bye. Bye.